Welcome to the Dots and Bridges Thought Leadership Consortium. My name's Pete Saronis, a self-proclaimed dot connector, a relationship builder, in addition to being the founder and CEO of Dots and Bridges. The public and private sectors share a symbiotic relationship, one that's necessary to enable efficient operations, workforce development, and technological modernization. However, well-intentioned efforts to collaborate across public, private, academic, nonprofit, entrepreneurial sectors tends sometimes to focus more on the buy-sell paradigm versus a seeker-solver opportunity. The consortium understands, appreciates, and values how human spirit, curiosity, and passion are key ingredients that can transform business operations and culture. As such, we're honored today to feature Ms. Renee Terran, Fortinet, Ch Deputy Chief Information o Security Officer, and Mr. Kevin Kerr, the deputy, or should I say, I'm sorry, the chief information security officer and IT risk officer at the Oak Ridge National Lab. Two thought leaders, change agents, and global influencers who understand how technology, humanity, and culture intersect. Welcome both of you today. Thank you, Pete. Thanks for having you. Yeah, I'm, yeah. I'm ex yeah, go Glad ahead, to Kevin. Be here. Yeah, yeah, no, super excited. And uh, I'm gonna brag a little bit about both of you then folks, we're gonna jump right in and, and listen to these pearls of wisdom and walk about stories and journeys that are unbelievably compelling and exciting. So Renee, I'm going to, I'm going to start bragging again, deputy chief information security officer. And again, you're allowed to correct me if I butcher this in some way, shape or form, not going to read your bio though, because it's too long and impressive over 20 years experience in cybersecurity, information, security, technology fields, engineering, ops, strategy, policy, Renee does it all, focuses on enterprise security in her current role in addition to what she does outside of the Fortinet culture. Uh, prior to joining Fortinet, I think what's exciting is that, Renee, you served in the national security agent in various positions. You were the special assistant to the director of national security agency for cyber and the director of the NSA cyber task force in which you advanced NSA's execution, not only of cybersecurity and cyber related missions, but you oversaw tons of the resources and those that helped support that mission. Super, super, super impressive, impressive, as well as shaping a lot of the strategy that came out of our white house. A board member at George Mason University School of Engineering, married with two kids. Yes, Loyola University Greyhound. My brother went to Loyola, so I'm a big fan. Bachelor's degree there in management information systems. And then she's also a Terrapin. She has her University of Maryland, University of Maryland, University College, Master's in Computer Information Technology Administration and Management. And that's just a synopsis of this incredible, incredible individual. So is that all right there, Renee? Did I cover a good basis? That's perfect, Pete. Thank you. You got it. And we'll get into that because what I'm excited about is the fact that you've walked in the world of government and now you've translated that out into industry. Kevin Kerr, my colleague and friend, Chief Information Security Officer and IT Officer at the Oak Ridge National Lab, which is one of our 17 national treasures. If you follow and understand what these incredible, incredible institutions have performed over the years, decades, centuries, whatever you want to think of it as, but incredible, incredible um, environments. 37 years of experience across, again, cyber, cyber physical, information assurance and, and governance. You probably have seen Kevin, I'm sure, speak on a number of occasions, but he's been somebody who in that lab understands the role that research and development has upon the impact or impacts our technology roadmaps for our country across all critical infrastructure sectors. Um, Kevin's got an innovative approach uh, every day of the week and twice on Sunday. He's super collaborative. He represents what open government is all about in terms of just helping establish partnerships, but fostering those, those, those relationships that are so important with government and industry. He established a joint venture with the Veterans Administration for the Million Veterans Program. We'll talk a little bit about that. That exudes partnership. He's a true leader in every sense of the word. He's worked with senior federal and board leaders to enable missions while focusing on security and resiliency, a word that will come up quite a bit today. Uh, Kevin retired from the Air Force and Air National Guard as a Lieutenant Colonel, where he was a commander of Cyber Warfare Squadron. Kevin, of course, thank you for your service to our great nation. And uh, he's a, if I'm not mistaken, Siena, right? Siena College, and you're the Siena Saints. So that's cool, man. Um, I'm a Villanova Wildcat and a part-time Johns Hopkins University Blue Jay, I think they are, but oh, oh, there you go. All right, that's it, folks. That's the beginning. Our themes today are going to focus on partnerships, 
the greater good, and we'll talk a bit about that. And of course, the fact that cybersecurity is part of our daily life in the devices we use in our personal, but also in our uh, office environments. Uh, we'll talk a bit about trust and how we earn that. We have two folks who are, are part of that uh, experience and have some recommendations and solving big problems. So there we go. Renee, I'm going to kick it over to you. Um, it's 1114, so we will maximize our time. Renee Fortnet, please give us a little bit of your role and sort of why you enjoy so much working at that company, given your experience in government. Yeah, I mean, Fortnet's um, you know, founded in 2000, based in Sunnyvale, California. We're a leading cybersecurity company. Um, we are, we're traditionally known for their firewalls. Um, that's how Fortnet started. Uh, but I will tell you, we've expanded so much more beyond firewalls. Um, we have one of the broadest portfolios of end-to-end -end security solutions. Um, you know, and that ranged all the way from you know on-prem to cloud and hybrid. Um, and so, from my perspective, you know, one of the unique things about Fortnet is you know our our we have what we call a security fabric, and that's kind of what ties our, our technologies together. But it has an open API system, so we work and play well with others. So we integrate with other technologies beyond um, just the Fortnet technologies. And so, from my perspective, you know, our, because we have that security fabric, it comes with high degrees of automation and integration built in. When I spent time in the government, um, you know, from my perspective, one of the things that we try struggled with is we had all of these what I call different you know, solutions or ornaments on the tree. Mm -hmm. um, and where we struggled like was how do we integrate them together and get them work together as a cohesive team. Um, and so that's kind of what I've always enjoyed about um, our security fabric is because that integration is, is built in and because of the automation, um, you know, we've seen, you know, the adversaries are doing things at speed and scale, you know, leveraging AI and machine learning, you know, against us. And so because our fabric, you know, from my perspective, has that automation built in, um, it allows you to do, you know, cyber re re detection response um, at, you know, at speed and scale and, you know, doing more proactive versus, you know, reactive. Um, and that's kind of why I've joined Fortnet. Um, you know, when I looked to lose the government, um, it was a very tough, tough decision for me um, because I, I felt like, you know, I was doing greater good for the nation. Um, but for me, you know, going to Fortnet, you know, I still feel like I am doing that greater good because, again, we help protect. Um, we are in every major critical infrastructure. And so for me, you know, I still feel like I'm helping, you know, protect the nation in, in some form or fashion, you know, with the technologies we have at Fortnet. Yeah, no, that that's wonderful. I, I tend to write down my tweetable moments. So I wrote a few when you were talking there. I love ornaments on the tree. Uh, shout out because I love the role of being an agnostic. I was the chief technology officer at the US Department of Energy. I was sold to quite a bit. And I loved working with folks like, or I didn't get to know Renee while I was a Fed, but I'll tell you, talking to companies and Kevin will come over here to you in a minute, the importance of doing homework and really differentiating what it is you do as a you know, whether you're Fortinet or some other company, um, how you support the mission of government. I, I did my research. I mean, 450,000 customers worldwide, super impressive. Your, I think, security processing unit technology is unique and special. So folks read about that uh, if you're looking at securing your assets. And they have a very unique security fabric, which in government speak, you know, I think if you are wondering or think you know about them, I found that the visibility integration automation really speaks to our president's management agenda now, which is workforce for 21st century, automate and leverage data, modernize and transform with IT. So I think Fortnite bot embodies that really well. And we'll get to some of that other geeky stuff in a good way uh, as we talk about some of the capability and application in humanity. So thank you, Renee. Kevin, um, I think folks think of Oak Ridge and they go, ooh, Summit, fast supercomputers. I was doing a little research today. Uh, Summit, still number one in the US, always jockeying for position with our, our neighbors in other parts of the world. Uh, talk to us a little bit about, uh, Kevin, not just your role, but, but what you love as well about being in one of the most treasured institutions, if you will, where so much is happening, but it's also misunderstood as to what it is they actually do there. And of course, the importance of cyber physical security. Sure. Well, I mean, like you said, Oak Ridge is one of the, the national labs here within the Department of Energy. And we range in research of just about everything from A to Z. Uh, of course, we're more famous for our supercomputers, you know, being number one. And like you said, jockeying back and forth between other entities out there in the world. Um, but I mean, that's, that's what's really cool. I mean, not only do we have the fastest supercomputer, but you know, we do other things too. We have the spalatial neutron source. We have the high flux isotope reactor. And these are one of a kind systems. I mean, no one else has them. 
and they're enabling research to help us do all kinds of stuff. I mean, our, our reactor helps us build isotopes that are used for medical. No one else in the world does those, you know, so that's important. And we got to make sure that this, you know, these systems are secure, but open for research. So that's my biggest challenge as a CISO is allowing open collaboration with everybody in the world, just about, and but protecting the information at the same time. So it's a little bit of an oxymoron, open, secure. You know, how, do, how do you really do that? And it's a balancing act. So that, that's one of the things I love about being here. Plus, I mean, working with super smart people. I sit here and I listen to these people <clears throat> talk about, yeah, we're working with this or working with that. And I'm like, oh my gosh, how do we even do that? I mean, you know, getting, doing stuff with technology way, way beyond, you know, what people think. I mean, we're, we're in biology, we're into um, environmental issues, the next generation batteries. I mean, we cover everything. So the lab is here to help the world get better. And we do that. Um, for example, we were one of the first um, national labs and our supercomputer was used with COVID research, okay? Um, and we took 80,000 some odd proteins and you know, looked at that and narrowed it down to an acceptable number for you know, other entities to use the acceptable list of proteins to go figure out a, a cure for COVID or you know, at least how to stop it or slow it down. And what would have taken months and years, we were able to do on Summit and our other supercomputers within hours or maybe a day or so. I mean, so that's key and that's the level of satisfaction I get here, you know, working. Yeah, so yeah. It's, it's phenomenal. No, I, I, I've I, been there a couple times and I always want to go back and I always tell folks what an opportunity to visit. I know, Renee, you've you've talked and you can obviously mention as you see fit some of the collaboration you've done with the labs continue. It, it is they are truly amazing, wouldn't you say? Absolutely. Um, in, in my past life, I've, I've gotten to work with a lot of the national labs, including Oak Ridge. Um, and Oak Ridge has done some phenomenal work um, there in, in their research efforts. And, um, you know, Oak Ridge, just like a lot of the other national labs, um, they're truly a national asset. Um, they do a lot of work for the U.S. government, as well as the critical infrastructure. Um, so, you know, their, their research, um, you know, is, is really critical to our, our digital ecosystem. Um, but that also means that they also need to be protected um, because, you know, at, just as we see as in this value, you know, the adversary also sees, you know, the intellectual property and the research that they're, you know, having on their networks also, um, you know, as a prime, prime target. So, yeah, that, that's, that's wonderful. Yeah, I see you nodding there, Kevin. Let me just say something. Kevin used a few polysyllabic terms, but again, this is publicly available major R&D facilities that Oak Ridge include carbon fiber technology, nanophase material sciences, structural molecular biology, and I love this one, high flux isotope reactors. I kind of know what it means, but folks, transportation research center, Oak Ridge leadership computing facilities, splation neutron source. Those are mission areas. And I, I want to I wanna go back to Renee because Renee, and a lot of the, the prep call topics that we address, there really was, as I said at the beginning, there's in the beltway inside of government <clears throat> buy sell government spends 90 billion a year on it they spend and give out close to 140 billion thereabouts in r d for grants and the thing so there's a relationship and there's a transaction that's obviously there but some of what uh, as two thought leaders that you are and i'm sure when you were a fed were getting a lot of knocks on the door and cards handed to you the partnership the public private partnership and the collaboration uh, is something i'd like to pivot to because Fortinet is clearly a great company. The Oak Ridge National Lab is a known entity, but it's people. And I think those that are watching today and, and, and listen to this type of consortium, it's there's folks saying, how can I get in front of Kevin? There's people saying, ooh, how do I get to talk about my product? And, and that to me is where it's more about seeking and solving and some of the tips that can be offered by folks like you, Kevin, uh, you brought up some really, really good ideas. So if we can go there, um, Renee, you you were one of those sought after folks who wanted to be, who people wanted to sell to. What have you found in the Fortinet culture to be uh, that you're you're helping them with? It's not about just the transaction. It's about that relationship, the trust and the cultivation. Absolutely. It, it's, it's really, building that, you know, that human to human relate that relationship. Um, you know, 
it's not helpful to just be seen anymore as just as a vendor. Um, you really want to be seen as a partner. Um, you know, when there's issues or concerns or I've got challenges that I'm trying to implement things, you know, you really want, you know, to have partners that can come in and help you with some of your technology uh, solutions. Um, so it's really getting to know, um, you know, who your potential customers are, understanding their mission set. Um, I think I shared you this on our, on our prep session. You know, I, I get contacted by vendors all the time. And, you know, it, it's clearly you can see the ones that haven't bothered to do their homework. Um, you know, I, I get emails and phone calls, you know, trying to sell me technology that Fortnite already has in our portfolio. It's we sell that technology. Um, but, you know, they're claiming they're going to solve all my problems. Um, you know, I'm a firm believer you, you need to understand, you know, the customer's perspective, you know, where they're coming from. You know, what are some of the challenges they're facing? You know, because, again, each industry has different challenges and obstacles they need to overcome. Um, and really take that time to, you know, get to know, um, you know, who you're reaching out to and, you know, those prospects. So um, from my perspective, you know, if you want to be seen as a partner, then you, you kind of need to be able to almost, you know, be able to, you know, take take a step back and look, you know, take a walk in their shoes. Yes. You know, understand what their challenges are. Um, because, you know, if you can't help them solve their challenges, if you don't take the time to even understand what they are. Well, exactly. Yeah, Kevin, I'm going to you on that because I just have to highlight my tweetable moments or at least mentally it's do homework, uh, understand mission. And I think, Renee, you uh, have been on the other end, but I, I think it's wonderful that good for Fortinet to have uh, that on the inside, which is even helping the, the good people in BD and sales and marketing saying, look, we have great decks, we have great solutions. I mean, there's no doubt that we're a compelling company, but I think Kevin back coming over to you on some of that, um, understanding the role, but, but you, you, the Oak Ridge national lab, you specifically cyber security strategist, you probably have tons of tools. There's a constant need for keep us educated. And, and how do you view that relationship? What are some opportunities for the relationships to be cultivated that you have realized in your walk about what works, what doesn't? Sure. I, I think Renee, you know, hit the nail on the head with many points there about knowing that, you know, what's important, know what I need, know my business. Um, just like Renee, I'm constantly getting emails and calls. Hey, I've got the, the best thing since self-slicing buttering bread. Um, and, you know, that doesn't work. Come to me and say, hey, I've got this. I know you have this but this is how we can do it. This is how it's different. I also know you have this other tool. This is how we integrate with that. And we'll actually help you integrate your tools, especially from a cyber perspective, how tools will integrate with each other in order to give me the best picture. You know, everybody always talks about the single pane. Uh, that's really important, you know, for people in cyber, but it's also important for management um, in sense of, I want to be able to turn around and I want to show management with a single pane of where our risk posture is, you know, where our threats are, what's going on in our environment. And I need tools that can help me do that. And, you know, not tool, no tool is going to do that out of the box. So I want a vendor who's going to help me tune it, tweak it, build it, and, you know, get it there. Um, and we've had many who do that, you know, and help us get there. So, that's key. And you got to be willing to sit there and go, okay, our tool maybe doesn't do this, but you know, this is where we're going. Share your roadmap with me. Let me know where you're going. Even use, you know, get us involved with your roadmap. I mean, National Labs, we're doing state of the art technology in the next generation stuff. I mean, our next generation supercomputer, the exascale computing system. I mean, we talk about partnerships. Work with us and tell us how you can be involved in that partnership. You mentioned the Million Veterans Program. You know, that's a partnership. So, I mean, we talk to them and how we can help them analyze data, you know, very quickly to help with serving our veterans, ensuring they're safe, ensuring, you know, they get the help they need, helping identify, you know, risk factors maybe associated with suicide prevention. Mm. I mean, this is real-time threat stuff. And, you know, I, I appreciate you giving me credit for leading the effort for the joint. I, it was actually our researchers that did it. I was just the guy that made the cyber, you know, made the cyber um, appeasable and acceptable to the veterans program. You know, so, but, you know, but that's, that's important too, because I have to go to them and I've got to know their business and their concerns. So I have to think as a vendor, you know, I'm going to, you know, we're trying to work with the veterans, you know, administration. I've got to be able to sell Oak Ridge 
and say how we're going to protect their information, how we're going to protect all that stuff, you know, all that PII, uh, personally identifiable information. Sorry, I, I try not to use acronyms. Um, it's all you good. know, it's and all protected good. health information. How are we going to protect that? And how are we going to ensure that not only to the Veterans Administration, but our vets? And you know, we got to be able to do it down to, to the person. Yeah. So it's key. So I understand what vendors have to do because I have to do it yes. as a CISO. You know? yeah. yeah, that that's a great comment. I see, Renee, you're nodding your head. I'm, I'm taking it away from that one that, that obviously it, it's, again, I don't know if it's the word all overused, but symbiotic. And when I was, Kevin, as you know, I called myself the connective tissue officer as the CTO. I'm like, my job is more about knocking on doors and, and going and finding requirements in the family of the DOE. And people would say, what are you doing here? We know what we need. I'm like, I just want to understand your requirements. And I, I, I get a sense as an advocator for industry inside of Oak Ridge, but at the same time, you're helping share and, and be a bit of a Sherpa for industry. And Kevin, you do that in spades. You're an amazing collaborator. And, and I appreciate that insight. Renee, hearing some of that, I'm going to come back because, uh, again, if you go to Fortinet, you see security-driven networking, dynamic cloud security, AI-driven security ops. I mean, no doubt you can fulfill and support requirements. Um, can you talk, um, since Kevin brought up road mapping, I think what he mentioned there was awesome if you're selling Fortinet, for example, not you, but, um, hey, we have roadmaps, you have roadmaps. Maybe there's something that is worth talking together about without discussing, you know, a transaction. How is the roadmap at Fortinet evolving? Is it in constant state of evolution? Absolutely. I mean, we were founded by engineers, not marketers. Mm. Um, so our found founders, Kenzie and Michael Z, um, you know, are, are very forward thinking. Um, they look at where we are today, but always, you know, driving to where we need to be tomorrow. So we're constantly evolving. Um, I look at our portfolio, how it's evolved over the last, you know, even two, three years that I've been there. Um, you know, when I first started, you know, we didn't have a SOAR capability. We didn't have an EDR solution. Um, and so we're constantly evolving because again, you know, as we, we engage with our, you know, customers and partners, you know, we see how that demand and their needs are changing. And we're ensuring that we're with them every step of the way that we're providing those solutions that help drive, you know, their strategies. I mean, that's, that's our goal. I mean, security is always a business enabler. So our job is really to help our customers you know, do their, their business efficiently, effectively, and securely as possible. Yeah, I, we, we do a lot of those virtual, um, that we call executive briefing centers, and, and we bring our, our customers in to have those strategic dialogues, you know, so that they understand, you know, so we understand, okay, where are you going from a strategic standpoint? What, what is your roadmap for the next, you know, 12, 18, 36 months? And then understanding, you know, here's where our vision roadmap from a technology standpoint is, you know, and, and take that feedback from them. We, we also do our customer advisory boards where we take input from our customers, mm. so, you know, understanding where they're trying to go and here's where we're going. Are we on the right path? You know, at the end of the day, you know, we want to be delivering solutions that are going to be a scene of value, you know, to, to our, our customers. So that, that requires that constant strategic dialogue um, and interaction back, back and forth. Um, it's no longer, you know, a situation where here's a solution you know, good luck with it. You know, it's got to be that, that iterative feedback and, you know, partnership and collaboration throughout the entire process. So Kevin, comment. And then I have a question for Kevin about a lot of what Renee just said in terms of an actual, the protocol for having that engagement. Kevin, what are your, what are your thoughts? Yeah. So Renee mentioned the customer advisory board and I'm, I'm involved with a couple of those across, you know, the spectrum. And which is great. What's great about that is, I'm usually the only government rep on that, okay? Which is great in that they have us in there, but it's also a little scary as why, why isn't there another government entity or someone you know, in there? And some cabs you know, don't even have government representation. So I sit there and I listen. One, I learn from the industry folks, so it's great. Um, mm. you know, there's other CISOs and things like that. And I'm, you know, so I'm learning from them. But then I say, hey, from the government perspective, from the government perspective, and the, the private entities that are in there, you know, whoever it may be, they're learning from, oh, well, yeah, you know, we need to start being concerned about NIST 800-53 or NIST 800-34 or, or whatever, you know, NIST, mm -hmm. you know, publication yeah, you want to talk about. There's plenty of that. There's plenty there's, to there's read. A zillion, there's a zillion of them out there. But I think what's great is in that cab and in in those customer advisory boards, 
I get to see where they're going. And I'm saying, well, you're thinking about this. You're thinking about that. Because the government tends to be, everybody accuses us of being behind the curve. But in a lot of instances, I see us ahead of the curve. Mm -hmm. Okay. Um, There's things that we've been doing in government for quite a long time, you know, making sure you know, we have some compliance and, you know, repeatable processes, the capabilities maturity model, you know, things like that. That's great. Um, so I think that's very critical. And it's important because, you know, we drive things. You know, the government drives things. Yeah, we're the biggest out there, uh, you know. And if you can make it in the government, you know, you're, you're going to be able to go into industry and other places. And if you're able to get into the government, you know, you're showing other industries that you're meeting that some of the most stringent and sometimes, re, you know, regulatory requirements out there. So it's good in that respect. Yeah, I um, I totally agree. And I could tell you that one of the things that I find, uh, sorry, the dog's barking, but this is the world we're living in. So his name's Phineas Maximus Saronis, and he's a one-year-old puppy. You just articulated, Kevin, which to me embodies those tenets of open government. We need to be more participatory, collaborative, transparent, but yet we're busy. And, and I applaud Fortinet and obviously um, good catch for them to have Renee Taran, uh, customer advisory boards, people hear those. And, you know, I'm on a few, frankly, in industry and it's, we do get together with companies. We talk as former feds about what matters. And it's kind of interesting how, when you're the former, it's like, well, is that still relevant? And I'm like, yes. Um, and Kevin, you just, you articulated that. Um, when I hear, uh, Renee, you talk about these opportunities, do you, do you have uh, a, a sense you can share with maybe a, a use case or an exemplar of where having in a, whether it's in your cyber threat alliance relationships with other industry partners or being with some agencies where uh, an in, uh, a, a mention of, of here's what we need to actually influence the Fortinet roadmap, like a, a capability that was needed? Yeah, I mean, you know, definitely, you know, one of the challenges we saw, even talking with you know, our state and local, um, being able to do that security orchestration um, automation response, um, and, you know, even internally um, having that need, um, help drive some of that roadmap, because again, you know, the adversary is doing things at speed and scale. And so having those capabilities that can, you know, again, um, provide that, you know, as Kevin said, that, that single pane of glass, um, but more importantly, you know, do some of that automation and integration and then being able to do those playbooks where you can do um, automated courses of action, um, you know, to mitigate, um, you know, potential issues or, you know, threats within inside your network. Um, I think those are some of the, the driving forces um, that we had. Um, but also, you know, I look at things like our Cyber Threat Alliance. Um, you know, one of the things that, you know, Fortinet was a founding starter of the Cyber Threat Alliance, and it's... You know, it's a community of, you know, technology company, companies, uh, members that where they all get together and, you know, we share that timely, actionable um, intelligence um, to not only help improve, you know, our products and services to help protect our customers, but also, you know, really kind of, you know, take a stand against, you know, the adversaries and, you know, work together to improve the overall security of, of the, the digital ecosystem. Um, so, again, you know, helping be part of that, you know, what I call the, the early sharing slash early warning system. Um, to for you know the overall good of um, you know our customers and you know the nation. Actually, well, worldwide since we're a worldwide company, but yeah. Yeah, but that speaks to culture, and uh, I think that's a great takeaway. If anybody watching this, that it, some people I walk on the street and they'll say, "Fortnite, that's a firewall company, right?" And I'll say. That's a little something they do. Uh, but just to be clear, and I like to translate sometimes for our audience, security orchestration automation response, that's the drawn out version of the term we've been saying, SOAR. There's also security information and event management, SIM. There's user entity behavior analytics, UEBA. And then there's software defined area network, SD-WAN. Now that's just four. And we used a few of those today, but that again is the alphabet soup that if you're thinking of a, solution in today's day and age, Kevin, right? I know you know that maybe back in the day as boxes and appliances were sold, but the world's changed. We've got this internet of things. You talked about R&D and supporting sectors that aren't you know, just R&D for uh, science sake. You're, you're working with, with, with transportation and healthcare sectors, but in this alphabet soup world, just again, personal perspective, hey, I, 
I'm not going to say I'm older than you or younger than you, but I'll say I'm 53. Okay. I've been around the block staying current. Um, it's, it's, it's tough in a world that's clouded with so many tools. How do you do your technology due diligence in terms of depending on your teams? Do you have a vendor management kind of, Hey, every Friday at two, once a month, we invite people in who've done their homework, mind you. How do you, how do you um, stay current with some of your personal uh, technology diligence? So that's one of the nice things of being one of a bunch of national labs is another national lab may be looking at something. And I'm in partnership with the CISO at Lawrence Livermore or Brookhaven or Argonne. I mean, we're in partnership and they're looking at things too. And we talk among us. Okay. And they're saying, Hey, we're looking at X or we're looking at Y. And I'm like, Oh, I looked at that, you know, a couple months ago and here's some things we saw and we share things. So there's that constant collaboration um, between all the CISOs, but it's also, I talked to industry CISOs and they're saying, Hey, we're looking at this. We're looking at that. I'm like, Ooh, how did that help you? What did it do? I know a little bit about them and things like that. Um, so there's a lot of that going on. And of course, you know, um, the vendors that are in go, hey, here's some things we saw, you know, that we we do A through X or we do A, A through C. And we we have a vendor that we work with that does D, E, and F, mm-hmm. which may help you. Yeah. Um, and they come in and, and that's part of the collaboration. Okay. And that's where I, I get the best value, the biggest bang for the buck with vendors that say, you know, hey, we're doing this. Or here's someone that works great with us that can integrate and help you and bring you to the next level. I mean, uh, Renee mentioned it and you, you defined it SOAR, you know, the security orchestration. That's key, you know, mm. for us. I mean, we, you know, we're, we're pushing petabytes, you know, and exabytes of data, exahops, of, you know, of data. A lot, you of, know, lot of big data. Yeah. A lot of big, a lot of big data. Okay. And so, you know, people coming in and saying, hey, you know, here's how you can work with that. And here's how we can help you protect that. To me, the future is data, okay? It's, well, it's always been data, the protection of data and intellectual property. But I think the world's coming to the realization um, that you know, putting in an endpoint protection gives you this much protection. You know, putting in you know, gateways and bridges and firewalls and you know, SIMs and SOARs and all these things take you to this level of protection. You know, it's defense and depth. Well, another piece of that's going to be in the future is going to be protection of the data. Yeah. You see it with ransomware. Hey, I've stolen your data. Pay me bitcoins or I'm going to release your data. Well, if you encrypt your data and they stole it, who cares? Yes. Yeah. Okay. You stole my encrypted data. Okay. Have fun. You yeah, know? Yeah. What are you going to you do know? with it? Okay. I, I may get a black eye because you were able to steal it, you know, but you you haven't hurt hurt us. Well, okay, I think- just minimized. Yeah. You got that. Like this, I just... Yeah, I've got to minimize the risk and the threats. I mean, there's no way that, um, you know, we have a team here of great people. You know, and there's just just under 20 of us on the cyber team here at Oak Ridge. But you look at the, the adversaries, Renee mentioned them, nation states, they have hundreds, if not thousands of them. And you can't compete against that. So being able to, you know, get down to the most granular level, granular level of protection and automating things to weed out the noise and stuff like that, that's critical. I mean, that's where the future is. Yeah. Um, Renee, I, and for both of you, uh, I, you know, I'm, I'm hearing this because actually it's music to my ears. I, I have had an opportunity over the last five years since I left government to kind of impress upon a lot of what you've spoken to, which is building relationships and doing homework and, and, and not always being in cell mode, but helping companies really, um, talk about their technology that evolves. And I keep thinking about what you said early on, Renee, about visibility and automation and your security fabric. And I think that's really, this is a comment, embodies that um, maybe SOAR was the thing we did and needed, but then we needed a SIM and then we needed a UEBA or maybe we need an endpoint or maybe we now left, it just, it's so much. And, and, and as a company, uh, you want to say we can do it all, but we're not a silver bullet. We're here to mitigate risk. We're here to mitigate Correct. risk so you can manage it. Is that a fair statement about Fortinet? I mean, yeah. coming from me. I mean, a lot of people say, you know, you know, what what is that silver bullet? And I, I don't think there is 
any silver bullet when it comes to doing the security. And I think of what Kevin says, it's a layer of defense. I think if there was a silver bullet, Fortnite would have created it by now. Um, it just doesn't exist. So you do need to do that defense in depth. And I'll add on an additional thing to that is also having that security awareness training. I mean, Kevin brought up the whole fact about ransomware. Well, when you look at the ransomware attacks, over 50% of them start by social engineering attacks. So those phishing, those spear phishing, um, you know, attacks. Um, so it's really also important that we don't forget the the people aspect, um, you know, beyond just the, the technology. It takes people, processes, and technology. Um, you can have some of the best technologies in, in the world, um, but they can be circumvented by, you know, human error or not properly implemented or configured properly. So also having that security awareness training is key. Um, and that was kind of one of the needs that we saw early on when we started at the beginning of this year with, you know, um, you know, things have been going on with the pandemic, people are now working, you know, from home remotely, people that never had that experience before. And so, you know, so we offered up, you know, security awareness training free um, to help address that problem because we saw, you know, not only we have issues as a company, but all companies are having issues. Like how do we make sure we train those people that not didn't, didn't normally work remotely Yes. Um, knew what that meant, you know, what are good cyber hygiene, what good practices now, because you may be using, you know, insecure computers and in, insecure networks to now access, you know, your critical organization's information. Yeah, I'm going to, I'm going to slam dunk or underscore the security awareness training still has, I think, a thing to it. I don't want to say it's a stink, but it's like, oh, that thing I have to do. But, but let's be real. It, it is changing. And I remember yeah. being in the Fed, it was, oh, I can, buzz through this. I know about not putting passwords on post-it notes. I'm aging myself here. But, but at the same time, I think that when, when our country is emphasizing 21st century workforce and we've got folks saying automation will, will allow the human and its intuition to, to still make those decisions, I find that training and awareness and um, <clears throat> that you've mentioned and Kevin too, how important it is. So those of you watching today, don't treat it like it's a exercise that you need to be aware through this training about the threats that, that have expanded our threat landscape, because we want right. the creature comforts of being connected, right, Kevin? But, you know, there's a threat that comes with that. Um, Kevin, did you want to comment on that? I had a I question. I was just going to say, you know, I, I, when I, when I talk to people, I say our biggest threat is our user. Mm. And I'm not being mean or, you know, anything like that, but our biggest asset and protection is also our user. I mean, so they have a dual role. They see things, they get the emails, they get, they see the links that don't look right. And so they're notifying our security operations center. Hey, I got this email. Is this legit? Is this right? You know, you know we get 18 million emails a month here easily in the lab and our filtering systems take out 15 million of those as spam or garbage, but that's 3 million emails still coming into the lab on a monthly basis. That's a lot of room for stuff to come in. You know? Yeah. Plus, plus in the cloud world, I mean, everybody's moving stuff. I mean, we use the cloud heavily. Okay. We're, we're using various cloud vendors and suppliers and document sharing facilities and capabilities. You know, we're all over the board and we allow our people to do that because they need that for the collaboration, for the scientific research. Yep. But, you know, I'll get back to information. We also have to educate those users and those people. Okay, this is the information that you can put here, but you can't put it here, you know, or that you can share this information with, you know, this person from this country, but not that country or this business, not that business. You know, so it's, it's, it's a very, um, you know, it goes back to the defense in depth. Yes. I've got a firewall on my perimeter. I've got, you know, firewalls inside. I've got endpoint detection, but I still have a person with a mouse that's going to go click and game over. Yeah. Yeah. You know, I, uh, I love that. And, and I, I think that education, we talk on the consortium a lot about being, uh, one who can inform, educate, and enlighten. And, and both of you are doing that. And I hope whoever watches this really takes to heart a lot of what you're saying, because I know it's not a moment in time. It's stuff that you've seen and, and, and you believe today and tomorrow. All right, a couple of questions and we'll hit our parting shots. Um, putting on your little, vi not little, putting on your visionary hats. Look, you're both thought leaders, you're change agents, and you have to deal with operations and stuff that's happening every day. But what do you, Renee, when you think of whether it's at Fortinet or just your experiences as an I call the walkabout, what are the technologies of the future that you're most excited about or you're listening and watching and hearing in your day-to-day? -day? Um, again, I, I think one of the things I, I'm 
you know, most excited about is really, you know, looking to leverage more of the AI and machine learning um, mm-hmm. to help drive, you know, the, the security protection defenses and, and response. Um, because I think the adversaries is, is leveraging those technologies against us. And I think we need to be, you know, leveraging them in our arsenal, um, you know, to kind of fight fire with fire, you know, in, in, in our ecosystems. Yeah, no, great, great, great point. And I have a comment on that because well, I'll just say it. I think AI and machine learning are what are underpinning our cities of the future. And I like to talk about smart cities, but the technology like a Fortinet or technology developed in a lab supporting one of those 16 sectors or those 55 national critical functions in our country actually end up impacting society and the, the individual. And, and uh, I think what you just said is spot on that we need to know technology is not the problem. It's just how do we we integrate and implement. So great points. Kevin, what about you? What, what excites you about the future? And, you know, again, whether it's something you're working on now at Oak Ridge or just you think is going to be the game changer. Well, I, uh, I'll go back to, I mentioned it a little earlier, information. We need to protect information at the level, but you have to do it based on identity. You know, do I want Pete having this data? And if I give it to Pete, do I want him sharing it with Renee? You know, so I want to be able to get to a point where I can say, I have this information, Pete can share it, but he can't share it with Renee, you know, and things like that. That way, you know, we're protecting what's really important, the intellectual property, okay, yeah. and our information, because that's key. Everybody wants our information. I, I said it earlier, we had people coming after our COVID stuff, you know, when we were doing the research. And, and we protected it well, you know, because we implemented multi-factor authentication on our supercomputers early on, you know, years ago. Other countries, you know, if you remember the news when COVID was being researched, other countries had to shut down their supercomputers because people got in because they weren't using multi-factor authentication. Mm. You know, so we did that, you know. So there's a lot of little things. And, you know, I think one thing to do is, you know, just move in that direction if we start thinking, you know, What's the, what's the most important thing is our information. I want to, I want to get to that. And that's what I want vendors to start working on and going toward is how do I protect information, you know, at the point of creation and associate it with, you know, a person or capability at that point. You know, that's key. And of course, artificial intelligence, it's great. It's wonderful. We see it. It's driving cars. It's flying planes. I mean, it's doing everything. And that's key. You know, we got to be able to use that to our advantage. And you got to use it in the sense of being able to detect the bad stuff that's going on, the things that shouldn't be happening. I mean, we know our adversaries are using it to get into us. You know, my, one of my previous life endeavors was I was, I was a hacker for 10 years. I ran red teams. You know, so I know how, how they think to a point. You know? um, so I have a little different perspective of you know, security and cybersecurity. I look at it. I want to protect my info. Yeah, I I I know that was long winded. Sorry. No, I love. Listen, that's the point, right? Nobody can say "Ah, I don't know how Kevin Kerr thinks. Um, I love protect information at its creation. That's or something. That was awesome. Um, All right. I said two questions, but actually, I have one. Renee, what's the most challenging aspect of your job? Um, I I think for from from my perspective, um, you know, it's it's really making sure that you're seen as a strategic partner, as an enabler. Um, you know, I, I you know, I've always told my teams that, you know, our, our job is, yes, we, we live and breathe security um, and security is critical to the mission, but at the end of the day, um, our job is to be seen as a strategic partner. Can't be that organization of, um, you know, we're all good ideas got to die because security always says no. <laughs> so you need, really need to work, you know, with your customers, which, you know, would be the internal organization for me um, to make sure that you, you understand their requirements because ultimately, you know, we're, we're there to help them do their job safely and securely. So it's really making sure that you don't get too far down in the weeds and, you know, the technical side of things um, without having your, your, your mind on, you know, where are we trying to go as a company, as an organization from a strategic perspective? And making sure that the technology and the security strategies align with those business objectives. Man, I love that strategic, tactical, operational. But yeah, that that is uh, spoken like a true former Fed who's now doing great things. So keep doing what you're doing in that Fortinet culture. Kevin, what about you, man? What, what do you find most challenging in your job? Yeah, you know, I think Renee hit the nail on the head. You know, cybersecurity has always been looked at as no. I don't want to be the no and in innovative. Okay. Mm. 
I, you know, I, I want to, I want cybersecurity to be the partner that's going to enable you to do things right. And the, the best way for you to ensure your work is your work and it's not messed with. I mean, I've had to talk to researchers. Do you want someone publishing your data before you do? Do you want someone messing with your data such that when you publish, it looks false and your reputation shot? And that's how I sell security to people that have normally been, no, run, here comes the cyber guy. You know, so our objective is, you know, not to be the no and innovative and to enable people by doing the right things right. I love it. I mean, these are, man, you're going to get all the credit when I use them, by the way, both of you. These are some really, really good ones. Okay. We're moving into parting shot land, but I just want to emphasize how much I appreciated those last comments. Um, I think that that when you transition out of government while you're still in government, we all know it's very hard to have time in the day to to really do a lot of what uh, you both are focusing on in your individual and then in, inside of your business. I mean, we all want to meet and learn and be educated, but look, coming from me for what it's worth, keep doing that, keep expressing that to your, your, your various teams. I mean, Kevin, you have a number of incredible people who I know are working with industry and, and, and sometimes the dialogue just to be, has to be orchestrated so that there's not just a moment in time, but hey, you know, if it's Fortinet, great. What are they doing that's unique that we can maybe share with other lab institutions? And that's great. And Renee, obviously you're doing that. And I think it's important even at the most senior executive level that you're in that, that you, you continue to impress upon those who, you know, carry the bags and say, look, build the relationship, establish the trust and good things will come. So that's my takeaway there. Okay, parting shot. Here's the rule. Actually, you can take as much time as you want, but um, it's usually what do you want to leave with the audience based on today's topic? And you can go in the, if it's something cool about Fortinet or Oak Ridge or just what you feel folks should take away and, and, and ideate over. So, you know, we, we leave a lasting impression. Uh, I'll start with Renee, parting shot. Yeah, I mean, from my perspective, um, I think we've seen, you know, a lot has changed, you know, in the operating environment, um, you know, especially over the last year. Um, and so obviously as the attack surface grows, you know, you need to make sure that you're really looking at those risk uh, mitigations to really address, you know, this new operating paradigm. Um, and again, like I said, it takes people, processes, and technologies. Um, you really need to be focusing on things, you know, like, you know, your zero trust, you know, security driven networking, security in the cloud, you know, whether, you know, you're doing on-prem in all in cloud or hybrid, um, and also making sure you're having those AI driven security um, operations. Um, and so from my perspective, you know, the adversaries aren't slowing down. Uh, if anything, they've, you know, accelerated um, over the last year. And so from my perspective, um, you know, it's key that you're really looking for, um, you know, solution providers or suppliers that are partners, um, not just vendors. And you should be looking at solutions that provide you that broad visibility across the entire attack surface, um, integrated, they work and play well with others and that they're automated. Um, from my perspective, that's really gonna be the key for meeting the challenges of today and tomorrow. Well said, wonderful. Kevin, parting shot. So my parting shot, shot is, you know, partnerships. You know, we can't do it alone. We need, we need everybody, you know, it's all hands on deck. You know, this is, this is not an easy world and it's only gonna get worse. You know, information's been monetized you know, by the, by industry and by us, that's great, but it's also been monetized by the bad folks. Okay. So the, the partnerships to make sure we're all in this together, we either sink or swim together. Um, I mean, it's, that, that's gotta be there and you gotta rely on your people. I mean, technology can only do so much. It can do a lot. I mean, they can, it can drown you with information. But if you don't have the people to, to be able to look at and go, mm, that doesn't look right. Or, you know, I don't, I just don't have a gut feeling about that. I mean, technology is not going to replace that. So it's partnerships and people. Wonderful. I, I'm going to say that a, for a big thank you. Um, I mean, some of these are truly pearls of, of wisdom and I, it's just affirming for me. So thank you both for being on the consortium. I, would only hope that that you continue to do and take your passion, your authenticity and humility are so, so obvious. And I hope, again, people watching this can learn a bit about how you establish partnerships and, and cultivate those over time because it doesn't just happen. So Renee, you're wonderful. Keep changing the world. 
Kevin, can't wait to see you again, but keep changing the world. Stay healthy. And um, we will absolutely talk again soon.